Once again, hello, my name is Cameron DeVazier here at Amazing Discoveries and today we're going to be looking at a message entitled The Gift of Tongues and it's exactly what you think it is. It's a study on the biblical truth of the gift of tongues. What is it? What isn't it? And do we see it still in a use today? But before we begin any study of God's Word, let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to fellowship together, to worship your name, and to study your word. And now as we turn our attention to the pages of Scripture, we ask that the author of Scripture be sent to give us instruction in the wisdom of God, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're just going to dive right on into our study before we look specifically, however, at the gift of tongues, let's look at the purpose of spiritual gifts at all. What are they and why were they given? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, the Apostle Paul writes to the Corinth church, and I believe to us today as well, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Now, ignorant is not a derogatory term. He's not calling people slow-witted or stupid or anything like that. He's simply saying, I don't want you to be uninformed. I want you to know the truth. I do not wish you to be ignorant. He goes on to explain, verse 4, There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. Right? So the source of these gifts, spiritual gifts, should indicate they're from the Spirit of God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit want us to be uh, equipped for service, and so he gives gifts. But notice what it says in verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one, and this is key, for the profit of all. Notice right here we see... As he, as he wants us to not be ignorant about spiritual gifts, he says spiritual gifts are from God, but they're for not the individual, but for the profit of all. Apparently spiritual gifts are not something for you and your personal walk with God to have an interesting special relationship, but they're to be used for the service of others. Profitable for all, the scripture says. In fact, uh, and he explains, for one to, for verse 8, For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to, the, uh, to another the interpretation of tongues. But look at verse 11. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So it's an important thing. Number one, there's a whole variety of gifts, and I don't know that this list is exhaustive, but there's a bunch listed out already. And he says, but they're not given to everyone. Each one gets something as the Spirit determines, as the Spirit wills. Which tells us, by the way, the Holy Spirit is a volitional being who can decide, who can will something, and it is not up to us what spiritual gift we receive. Apparently, spiritual gifts are not practiced, they're not learned, they're not developed, they're simply given. That's the nature of a gift. Gifts are given. Wages are earned, but a gift is given. And these are spiritual gifts given by God to each one, as the scripture says, individually as he wills. Now, let's see some examples of this. Is the, is the gift of tongues, or even spiritual gifts at all, is this simply a New Testament phenomenon, or do we see it in the Old Testament? Well, it's an Old Testament thing, too. Let's go back to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 35, as the children of Israel were making preparations for the sanctuary, which would be the home of God, his dwelling place among his people, he wanted all the pieces of furniture to be built according to the pattern shown to Moses on the mountain. And he didn't just say, all right, anybody can just pick up a, a chisel and start working or, or start smelting together metals. No, no, no. He already had these artisans gifted, or I should say, able to do these things. And it says in verse 10 of Exodus 35, All who are gifted artisans among you shall come and make all that the Lord has commanded. So he says, I want you to take all the people who already have the ability to make fine craftsmanship, craft works, I want to employ them in the establishing of my sanctuary. But beyond that, we see in verse 30 of the same chapter, and Moses said to the children of Israel, See, the Lord has called by name 
Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and he has filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and understanding, in knowledge and all manner of workmanship, to design artistic works, to work in gold and silver and bronze, in cutting jewels for setting, in wood carving, and in to work in all manner of artistic workmanship. So he's not just having one trade. Apparently he as the overseer. He's got the ability and knowledge in every one of these tasks. And it goes on to say in verse 34, and he, that is God, the Spirit of God, has put in his heart the ability to teach. In him and Aholiab, the son of Ahasmach, I don't know how to say that correctly, of the tribe of Dan, Verse 35, he has filled them with skill to do all manner of work on, of the engraver and the designer and the tapestry maker in blue and purple and scarlet thread and fine linen and the weaver, those who do, do every work and those who design artistic works. Now, apparently there were artisans who could do each particular task as a natural ability, but these two gentlemen, apparently the Lord gave them the ability to understand how to do all of those tasks and the ability to teach so that the Lord's sanctuary would be built according to plan. The Lord had something, a work to be done, and he gifted individuals with the ability they needed, the spiritual gift, to accomplish it. We saw in Daniel chapter 1 the same thing. Daniel chapter 1, as Daniel and his friends were taken from Jerusalem captive into Babylon, it tells us that they came with some natural abilities. That's what the king was looking for when he took them captive in the first place. Daniel chapter 1 and verse 3. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge, and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. Apparently with no spiritual giftedness at all, these gentlemen came with standard equipment in their life, these latent abilities, these already innate uh, qualities. But the Lord gave them something more for his service. We continue in the same chapter in verse 1. It says in verse 17, chapter 1, verse 17, As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. So Daniel is called here to be a prophet of God who can understand visions and dreams while he can read and he's quick to understand and all those other things, the Lord gives him a special gift in order to do the work that God needs him to do. Now let's take this same template and go to the New Testament. Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, we find the day of Pentecost. And this gets us closer to our understanding of the gift of tongues in particular because that is the gift that was poured out on the day of Pentecost. Chapter 2 and verse 1, we'll just read directly from Scripture. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, that is, the disciples of Christ. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now before we dissect this any farther, or we, before we make any further progress in the text, let's read and understand what we've just seen here. Notice they were all together in one place. The power, the, the Spirit, came from heaven, descended on each of them, and according to the text, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and begin to speak with other tongues. Now, are these natural languages that these men already could speak? No. Why do we know that? Because the very next phrase says, as the Spirit gave them utterance. This is not something they naturally had. This is a supernatural endowment, an ability given by God through the Holy Spirit. Now, the question arises, what are these other tongues? And there's a great contention inside the Christian church today as just what is the gift of tongues? What are these tongues that were spoken on Pentecost? And some people say, I speak even now, and they'll speak gibberish, languages that people cannot understand. They themselves don't even understand it. They say, well, only God can understand it. There's no way to know it. 
Is this the biblical truth about speaking in tongues? Well, let's consult the Bible as the story unfolds. Notice what the very next words of Scripture are about the day of Pentecost in verse 5. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. So it lists off, as we're going to see here in just a moment, nations that are under heaven. These are not heavenly visitors. These are earthly visitors, just people from other countries. And it says in verse 6, And when this sound occurred, that is the sound of the rushing wind, the multitude came together and were confused. And you'd say, aha, that's how we know it's a confusing language because they did not understand. But wait, friends, don't just stop the Bible passage there. Let the Bible continue to speak. In fact, I would dare say that a vast number of our questions about doctrine and scripture would be resolved quickly if we just kept reading. Let the Bible explain itself. It does say that they were confused, but it tells us why they were confused. And were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. It doesn't say they were confused because they couldn't understand. They were confused because they could understand. And you'll understand why that makes sense as we keep reading. Verse 7, Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? They would expect them to speak one language. And these are unlearned fishermen, many of them. One language from the, from the land of Galilee. Yet here we are from all these other nations, and each one of us hears. And he goes on to say that very thing. Look, are not all these who speak Galileans in verse 8? How is it that we each hear, each in our own language in which we were born? These people speak our language like it's their own native tongue. Just as much as we were born, and apparently they were, but they're all Galileans. How is it possible? Again, they weren't confused because they couldn't understand. They were confused because they could. And it lists them off. Verse 9, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Notice again, they're amazed and perplexed, not because they don't understand, but because they do. Their perplexity is why is it possible that we now hear so clearly? Why are they speaking to us in a language native to us, yet they've never been to where we've been? How is this possible? The confusion was in the significance, not in the language itself. Now, as we see the gift of tongues, In Acts chapter 4, watch this now. Now, let's just, in fact, let's stay with Acts chapter 2 real quick. Let me show you something else. After Peter preaches his sermon about the Jesus the, these individuals just over a month ago had crucified, but now Peter says, he is your Lord in Christ, watch what happens here. Verse 37, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, does that necessarily mean that they're all going to be given the gift of tongues? No. Because as Paul's already listed off in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, there's a whole diversity of gifts. Everyone is going to be gifted, but it's as the Spirit wills. And there's no evidence in the text that these believers were now given the gift of tongues like the apostles were. goes on in verse 39, For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as our Lord will call. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be, be saved from this perverse generation. Those who gladly received his message were baptized, and that day 3,000 souls were added to them but never does it mention them receiving the gift of tongues. Now let's think about this. Why would the gift of tongues be given to the apostles to preach this message, but then not be given to those who receive the message? Well, it makes sense. If speaking in tongues 
is exactly what Acts chapter 2 describes happening on the day of Pentecost. It's the ability, the God-given, spirit-enabled ability to speak a language not native to your own, a language that someone else is native in, another nation under heaven, from another place, another, another language group. If that's merely what it is, then it makes sense that the apostles would be given it because collected in Jerusalem were people from every nation under heaven. It even lists them off. But those people who hear the words, who receive that message, who accept and believe, when they go back home to their country, everyone's going to be speaking the same language. When the Romans go back to Rome, when the Greeks go back to Greek, Greece, uh, uh, when, when the Arabs go back to Arabia, wherever they're from, the Cretans go back to Crete, all of them will speak the same language, and they're going to share what they heard, but they don't need the gift of tongues. They just need the boldness to preach it. They might need some other gifts at that time and place, but there's no need to give them the gift of tongues because they're going to be speaking to people who already know the same language. If people are already of the same language, what would be the purpose of the gift of tongues? Apparently the gift of tongues is supposed to be a witness to those who don't believe yet so you can reach them with the message of Jesus Christ. This is the consistent picture that we see played out throughout the book of Acts. Now let's go to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4 and verse 31. Here the believers in Jerusalem were praying together and look what scripture records. Verse 31 of Acts chapter 4. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And it says, and they spoke the word of God. And you would expect, if they were filled with the Holy Spirit, that the one true evidence, as some Christians claim, of being filled with the Holy Spirit is to be able to speak in tongues. That's not what the Scripture records. It says again, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God, not in other languages, but with boldness. They spoke the word of God with boldness. Now clearly, they were given a spiritual gift. The Holy Spirit was poured out and the room where they were was shaken. But the ability granted them was not to speak in different tongues, but to speak in the language that they had with boldness. And that's what they needed at that time, and that's what they received. Now why would they not be given the gift of tongues here? Because these are all of the same culture, in the same town of Jerusalem. They're not on a missionary journey. They're not going into new places. They just need to preach boldly where they are. And that's exactly what the Holy Spirit gave them. Let's look at another example of the filling of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, we start with verse 14. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet they had, uh, he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. But you'll notice no mention of speaking in tongues. Why not? Well, because who are they speaking to? Again, go back to verse 14. The apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God. Well, the Samaritans, for all intents and purposes, spoke the same language as those in Jerusalem. You recall from Jesus' own ministry that he had inter- encounters with people from Samaria, and he just spoke normally to them. You think of the woman at the well, the Samaritan at the well. This is, this is common language, and they knew each other's cultures, they knew each other's languages, so there was no need for a gift of tongues at this point. Now, however... There are instances, let's go two chapters to the right in the book of Acts, when the gift of tongues was given again. And we'll see why. Acts chapter 10, here Peter is preaching the gospel, explaining the truth about Jesus Christ to the household of Cornelius. And we'll pick up the story. Now Cornelius, of course, was not a Hebrew, not from Jerusalem. He was uh, was a Gentile. And it was a big deal to get Peter to even go and speak to him at all, if you follow the story closely. But when Peter does, watch what happens. Acts chapter 10, we'll start with verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. 
But in every nation who fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses, Peter says, of all these things which he did in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen, by, before, God by, chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to judge of the living of the dead. To him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. Basically, Peter preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ to this household of Cornelius. Watch what happens next. Verse 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, and many came with, and as many came with Peter, because the gift of the Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. And you say, aha, there it is. This is the gift of tongues again. That's true, it is the gift of tongues. But is it different than what happened on the day of Pentecost or is it exactly the same as what happened on the day of Pentecost? Well, as we go on, we find out that it's the exact, well, at least it had the same result immediately, verse 48, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord and then they asked him to stay a few days. Now, as the story unfolds, Peter had to go back and explain to his Jewish brethren in Jerusalem why he would go preach the gospel to the Gentiles who were uncircumcised and were not culturally Jewish. Now watch what he says. He goes and says in verse 16, as he's explaining to his friends, he says in verse 15 of Acts chapter 11, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. Again, he's saying, it was the same, I know it's the same thing because we were there at the first. What they did was corresponding to what we had. It's the same gift of tongues. Again, verse 15, As I begin to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. Then I remember the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And here's his punchline. If therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? Notice he says, it's the exact same gift that we experienced earlier. Now these Gentiles have. God has put his seal of approval upon our message to the Gentiles. Therefore, who, can I, who, who would I be to withstand God? I can't do it. Now notice, apparently there's two good reasons why the gift of tongues would be given here and not at other occasions. First of all, these unbelieving Jews, or these hard-hearted ones about the, spreading the gospel to the Gentiles, this was an evidence to them that it was the same Holy Spirit who had worked in them, and thus the gospel should go to the Gentiles. So it was an evidence to, to Peter and his friends in Jerusalem that the gospel should go to the Gentiles. And second of all, they're in a, a foreign land. They're in Caesarea, a strategic seaport that would be a location to reach many nations. This is a cosmopolitan, international city and thus the gift of tongues would be needed to spread the gospel there. And again, it happens in Acts chapter 19. We see the same experience where the gift of tongues was given in the town of Ephesus. Let's see it one more time. Acts chapter 19, verses, starting with verse 1. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he says to them, Into what then were you baptized? And they said, Into John's baptism. So apparently these people didn't have the present truth about Jesus Christ. They didn't have the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They were devout followers of God who had been baptized by John, but now they needed to come into the truth. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him 
who, should, who would come after him, that is, on Jesus Christ. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now, why would this happen now and not at other places? Well, again, where is the location? They are in Ephesus. Ephesus was a large and important commercial center in Asia Minor. Like Caesarea before with Cornelius, here believers would interact with many foreigners that spoke different languages than theirs, and they would be a missionary outpost for the gospel. As people would come through, they would speak to them in the language that they could have as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance to give the gospel message to the world. So let's go back to, Acts, uh, to 1 Corinthians. As we wrap this up, our study on the gift of tongues, and by the way, that's every example of the gift of tongues and the Holy Spirit being poured out in the book of Acts. Every one of them. And it seems to correspond exactly with what was the foundational experience the day of Pentecost. Now Paul comes back in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and he explains specifically about the gift of tongues. And with the study we've just done, now his further explanation makes more sense. Acts chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, chapter 14, verse 1. He says, Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. Now you might say, aha, let me take that one text and I'll tell you all about the gift of tongues. It's mysterious, it can't be understood, but no, 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 no. What Paul is talking about here is in the household of faith where people speak the same language, if you have the ability to speak in another tongue and instead of using it to show forth the glory of God to non-believers, you simply use that gift, or I should say abuse that gift in the household of God to show off your new ability to speak in a language, he says, that's no good. No one understands you. If, you can, if, you, if you're standing in an English audience and you decide to demonstrate your spirituality by able to speak in Spanish or some other language, and no one can understand you, you haven't been a benefit to anyone. Remember the original purpose he said in 1 Corinthians 12 of the gifts of the Spirit was to be for the profit of all. It's not just for your own personal devotional life. There are no gifts given for that. The purpose of the gift of tongues and every other spiritual gift is the building up of God's church to be used for his service. Notice he goes, continues, but he who prophesies, that means speak as the spokesman of God in the language that the people understand, edif uh, speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. So clearly you would understand what you're saying, but no one else would. But he who prophesies edifies the church. And what again was the point of spiritual gifts? To profit all. And he goes on to say in verse 5, I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. Again, he keeps going on. And he goes on in verse 6, now, I, now, But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching? Even things without life, he goes on to use an analogy here. Even things without life, whether flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sounds, how will, be, how will it be known what is piped or played? For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? So likewise, unless you utter by the, by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? Apparently, the expectation is the gift of tongues should be understandable. But if you abuse the gift and speak it to people who don't understand, what's the point of you using it at all? The purpose of spiritual gifts is the profit of all. For you will be speaking into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of languages in the world. Notice he's talking about real languages right here on earth, not some, some heavenly language that no one understands. And none of them is without significance. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of a language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks it. And he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. 
Even so you, since you are all zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Therefore, so what's the summary? Let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. If you don't know the language of people here, pray that someone will be able to interpret what you're saying. He goes on to say in verse 14, For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. Now, does that saying that his own personal understanding or the understanding of his words by others? Clearly, it's the latter, given the context of the passage, given the broader context of our study throughout Scripture, that the purpose of spiritual gifts, especially the gift of tongues, is so that others can understand, not just so that you can have a private understanding with the Lord. It's for the profit of all. So we we see verse 14 makes complete sense in the broader context of our study. If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. That's not his own personal understanding. That's the understanding of those who hear his words. What then is the conclusion? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will also pray with the understanding. I'm not going to just come up here and do something that seems spiritual, but you can't understand it. I want every word to mean something to you, not just to me. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen? Like if you're going on and on and preaching and praising and giving a testimony of God, but they can't understand you, what's the point of you speaking? You're just speaking into the air. No one understands you. How does the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks since he does not understand what you say? For you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. By the way, why does that make sense that Paul would speak in tongues more than the others? Because of the nature of Paul's work. He's been set apart as a missionary to the Gentiles. He travels on these journeys all over, and he speaks in more languages than these who stay in Corinth. But, he says in verse 19, Yet, in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding than that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. Apparently, the Apostle Paul's burden of his heart was not to show off that he knew tongues, but to use the gifts according as the Lord gave him the opportunity to show forth the glory of God. Again, his goal was not to show off, but to show forth, to proclaim the praises of him who brought him out of darkness into this marvelous light. Which, by the way, why don't we see the gift of tongues used more these days? I would imagine it's the same reason we don't see more of the gift of healings. It's not to say that the gifts of healing or speaking in tongues or these other gifts are not available or the Lord has not sent them, but I believe that we have less need today. We have a technological revolution in our midst. We can can speak now and we'll go over there. We can translate. We have ability and knowledge has increased so much that we have less need of those kind of miraculous things. However, I am of the firm conviction that if the need arose... The same Spirit who sent it on the day of Pentecost could send it as was needed today. God's gifts through the Holy Spirit are not simply for our edification, or ever at all for our edification. They're to be used for the furtherance of His service, to spread His message, and by God's grace, to hasten His soon coming. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for being a God who gives us a mission and also gives us what we need to complete that mission. Lord, if you see in our own lives a ministry that needs to be taken care of, a building up of your body that needs to be done, let us be your faithful servants. And as we step forward in faith, if we lack any ability, any equipment, anything that we might need, we ask humbly that you would give it to us. Not that we could show off that we have these abilities, but we could show forth the praises of him who brought us out of darkness into this marvelous light. Bless us now as we seek to not only work for you, but Lord, through these efforts, may we see you come quickly. For we pray it in Jesus' name.